And we're live. Welcome in, everybody. I'm Tony Cotillo from Rise and React Media. This is the virtual book talk of Cruising Through Caregiving. And tonight, my partner in crime, I should say, my I wouldn't say my guest, you're my partner tonight, is home care, health care, home care experiment um, expert, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, author of Cruising Through Caregiving. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. We got a lot to cover tonight. So just introduce yourself, let everybody know your background, what you've done, and we'll go from there. Sure. So, Tony, I uh, have been working in healthcare, senior living, nursing home field since I was 16. So, 32 years, really long time. And uh, my goal in terms of writing Cruising Through Caregiving was really to make a chapter. Every chapter is a way that a family caregiver can reduce their stress because being a caregiver is one of the most stressful experiences that any of us could ever have. And yeah, I have worked in senior living. I've been a psychotherapist. I actually still, for 20 years, I've taught college as an adjunct and I still teach at Johns Hopkins uh, Certificate on Aging Program, gerontology uh, instructor. And I just, I really enjoy helping caregivers to make their experiences uh, less stressful because everybody needs a hand in caregiving. Isn't that the truth? And, and and maybe when you don't even think you need a hand, that's the thing. Maybe you're a caregiver. You don't even know it yet. And that's what we're going to get to. But before we get into all that, remember Jennifer's book cruising through caregiving right now, get on Amazon. You can get it at Barnes and Noble, wherever you get your books right there. You say it just full transparency. Me and Jennifer have worked together for a number of years. She's covered a ton of different press. We're talking ABC, NBC, iHeartRadio, Care.com, Healthline.com. I mean, you see it right there. She's been everywhere, and I've just been lucky and blessed to be uh, aside her throughout this journey. Well, so I'm lucky to work with you, I, Tony. Almost I, it, six it's years. Been, it's been so long. We don't even realize it's been that Almost long, Almost right? six years. It's crazy. And you know what I find really interesting when I hear Tony talk, and he being my publicist, is he starts to use the vernacular that I use. And I'm almost like, Tony is often quoting me back to me. And, and it's it's kind of funny because I know he, he really does that with all of his clients. He really gets the message of all of his, his clients and, and he really understands it. He strives to understand it. So you're a terrific partner to work with, Tony. Well, I appreciate that. And you have to be, you have to live it. You have to be inside you of it to understand it. How can, how can we pitch together if I don't even know what I'm talking about? Right. So it's definitely a thing. Adam checking. It says he works in healthcare and senior living too. Adam, as always for checking in, yeah. uh, Mike, what's up, Mike? I know you said you, you registered and uh, you had some caregiving questions so we can answer them later as well. Uh, but let's get right into the caregiving aspect. And what I will say is I don't think everybody really knows what a caregiver is. What does that word mean? Because I thought being a caregiver is just being a parent and not necessarily true, right? Caregiving is a whole new element. So if I asked you, Jennifer, if somebody asked you, what is a caregiver in your words? What would you tell them? Any person that's helping to take care of another human being. And obviously all of us think about parents as being caregivers. That's something that you signed up for, <laughs> right? You, you, you knew okay. ahead of time, most of the time you knew that it was coming. And you, a lot of us who became parents, we planned for it. we maybe took classes, we learned on the job, but for mostly for family mm -hmm. caregivers, you maybe are taking care of a special needs child. So it's maybe above and beyond simply being a parent or maybe an adult child with say a developmental disability. But more frequently, what I'm talking about is older persons, maybe your spouse who has Alzheimer's disease, maybe a parent who has Parkinson's disease, or maybe a sibling, uh, an adult that has a cancer diagnosis or has been in a terrible accident and they need care for a period of time. So anybody who is providing care for another individual is a caregiver. And I think that there's several different types in cruising through caregiving, I talk about the concept of a primary caregiver. And that person really, I liken that to a captain of a ship. They're steering and they're making the big decisions. And a lot of times there's only one caregiver in a family and that's not a good thing. So if you're the only caregiver 
taking care of one other individual, we want to encourage you to get a secondary caregiver or a first mate, somebody that supports you. Uh, if you're out on the water and my husband and I boat, if you're out on the water and you're trying to dock having, uh, or, or you're out there and the water gets really rough, having a first mate on board to, to help navigate those rough waters is, is terrific. And in a lot of families, that secondary caregiver or first mate might give that primary caregiver a break when that person needs to go to work or that person wants to go get their hair cut. They might help out with giving medicine or, or making a meal for the person who needs care. And then lastly, tertiary caregiver. I, I liken that person to the dock hand on uh, the dock when you're trying to to uh, bring your vessel to shore. Uh, if it's rough waters, you like when you see somebody on the pier. And that person is typically, I liken to somebody that does something that supports the primary. So maybe you're sending gift cards for meals. So because you know that that primary caregiver is maybe so busy running their loved one to the doctor, or maybe you hire a cleaning service for the primary caregiver because, you know, they don't have five minutes to clean the house for themselves. So there are many, many ways to be a family caregiver. Uh, there are it, it doesn't necessarily mean, though, that that loved one lives with you. You know, like Adam said, he works in senior living. It might be that your loved one lives in a senior living or maybe they live across the country, but you have some involvement in making sure that their needs are met. Are you there? Yeah. There? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we had a glitch. It happens <laughs> in the virtual events, right? A little glitch, but that, but you, you, you mentioned about roles and you, you mentioned not everybody signs up to be a caregiver, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't really sign up to be a parent the first time, full transparency, but I love, I love my daughter to death. But, you know, so, but sometimes, you know, when do you know it's time? When do you know it's, whether it be a, a spouse, whether it be a brother or sister, when do you know it's time to be a caregiver? And how do you have that sometimes that tough, excruciating conversation too because uh, we've done things right you've done things about when's it time to talk to seniors about not driving anymore but when is it time to have that conversation how do you do it when it's time to be a caregiver sadly a lot of it happens when there's a crisis so maybe somebody falls or maybe somebody has a stroke or maybe somebody uh has a, a, a really tough diagnosis they don't they're not feeling well and they get a tough diagnosis but so, so sometimes it's a crisis and obviously the best thing to do is to prepare ahead of time. So you're ready before a crisis. And so in terms of an older loved one, like say it's your parent or a grandparent, aunt, uncle, it, I think it's a good idea to have conversation with the older person in your life and just say, look, if you were ever not able to make decisions for yourself, what should I know? Or if, you ever needed help in the home? Is there something in particular I would want to know about your needs that maybe I don't know? And I'm going to just give you a, a little example, Tony. So one thing that I am really vigilant about is I always have water next to me. Always. I mean, it doesn't matter where I am. If I'm on an airplane, if I'm in bed, if I'm at the desk, I always have water. And I feel like if I ever was incapacitated or I couldn't speak for myself. I would want my husband to know, like, make sure I always have water. And I don't know that he would always think of that. Even yeah. when you live with somebody or, you know, they're your partner or, you know, you know your mom and dad really well, you probably don't know everything about them. So it can be really good to have conversations like that ahead of time. And what, you know, if, if you have to move to a senior living community, what's important to you is maybe being somewhere where there are religious services every day. For some people, that's really important. Or being somewhere where it, it, it's, it's very close geographically to all your grandchildren. I mean, so those are the sorts of things that it's nice to have conversations about ahead of time. Also finances. What is the financial picture? Because I say this a lot. If you ever do need services, you don't want to be looking at services that are 
you know, if you're, you know, shopping for a wedding gown, you don't want to be looking at the $10,000 Vera Wang gowns if your budget is $500. So it's, it's good for families to have open conversations about financial resources. And then if there aren't sufficient financial resources, you can look together as a family for uh, grants and for ways that different people in the family network can pitch in to help out. No, nah, that's a great point. You don't want to shop on a clearance rack when it comes to caregiving, right? I mean, it, it's very important. I remember, uh, God, I was in second grade and and my grandmother had a brain tumor. So she was an assistant living and that was tough. I remember even as a youngster, you know, watching, you know, my, my mom comes from a big family. She has uh, three brothers and six sisters. So she, and she's the babe, right? It's a big wow. family. So I, I seen a lot of the back and forth, the communication, because my grandmother lived with us. So it was that conversation like, okay, it's time we can't do this anymore. Time to go. And and I understood. So what do you actually look for in these facilities? Because I know you visit them regularly. You have a ton of webinars, as always. But what do you look for when you're finding a home for your loved one? So first of all, not everybody needs to move. There's a lot of people who need help at home and they can they can stay home. And that might be help from a paid caregiver or friends, family, people from their faith community. But if if you and or your loved one decide, okay, it's it's time, it's important that that you know people in the family can't handle it, the person can't live alone anymore. It's really about coming up with your non-negotiables. So clearly you want the place, you don't want it to smell bad. Uh, That I remember when I was young and I worked in a nursing home and I, I never understood that. I I thought that this was a smell that just the nursing home smelled like, but as I got older and got more seasoned, I realized what I was smelling was urine. And so that was, we don't want to smell urine. We don't want to smell, but I, I, but truly when I was a young kid, I didn't realize that that's what I was smelling. And so, but, but you also don't want it to smell really chemical, like lots of, of air fresheners and stuff, because that's often masking something unpleasant, but so you want it to just smell like nothing or big cookies or something like that. But you want to use your senses. Like, what does it look like? Does it look clean? Certainly there can be accidents, but are the staff cleaning up pretty quickly? Uh, Do the residents seem happy? And listen, there's going to be issues. No community is perfect. And not every resident, every second of the day is going to be smiling and happy. But, But do they look content? Do they look engaged? Are they making eye contact with you and others? So using your eyes, using your sense of smell, tasting the food is so, so important. Listening, how are the staff talking to the residents? And, you know, it's very, if, if there's a culture of disrespect, that's not hard to, you're not going to miss that. Or, and if there's a culture of respect in the way that people are talking to the residents, you're not going to miss that either. So just pay attention to tone and the the quality of the words. Are they infantilizing the residents or are they talking to them like they're adults? Older adults are adults and they deserve to be treated like grownups. So using using all of your senses, touch, you know, observe the way that staff are touching the residents and you know your gut feeling is often a big part of it as well that how do you feel could you see yourself living there could you see your loved one living there but i think also just what i might consider a great place for me or for my loved one might not be what you would tony just because of their needs like one thing i hear a lot from men this happens a lot with with gentlemen who are looking is not that they don't like women or not that they don't enjoy the company of ladies, but they want to go to a community where there's other dudes. They want to see other guys. And because women tend to live longer than men, sometimes you don't see as many men. And so that might be a non-negotiable for some, some men, some, again, like I said, maybe they want religious services every day, or this person is a great artist and they wanted the opportunity to take art classes or they, they swim and they want a swimming pool. So I think it's very, very important to 
to just come up with maybe three things that are your wish list that that are non-negotiable that you have to have or it's it's not going to be a good fit. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, M- Michael checking in says, "What do you what do you hear? What is the presence like of the workers?" Also, he writes, "Have a list of things they are responsible for. Who is their insurance? Who is their mortgage company? When is the tax stuff due?" Which is he's implying on how we know when is the right time to make that decision, right? But that's yeah. great, great, all great points. And and the other one, my brother is uh, in law enforcement, and he always says, uh, "Passwords are a huge one. Passwords. Look at that. That's huge. In the hospital, they have surgery. You know, where do they keep their passwords? And that that's another one to be mindful of too. I think that's a listen. There's a reason why you have to have all your ducks in a row, right? Because you just, you never know, right? And, and, you know, I just went through this weekend, just found out a a good coworker of mine, 49 years old, died in his sleep, had a heart attack, never knew. And again, who knows? Did did he have everything in order? Passwords in order? You know, he wasn't married, has no kids. So these are the questions that you have to ask, right? Uh, Michael says, I had a hard time with that when my dad had a stroke. I had no idea what his bills, his online accounts, when things were due. It's a great point. It, you know, so would you recommend, Jennifer, keeping some kind of, of a log or somewhere that, that that you know at that time? Because you do deal with, so everybody know, Jennifer deals with a lot of dementia as well uh, when it comes to topics and her webinars. So maybe the, the, the person gets to that point and, and they're not coherent enough, yeah. right? So it's a big recommendation, correct? Yeah, I think... Talking, maybe one thing that a lot of all of us can do, not just older adults, but like you said, Tony, people can die at any age unexpectedly, but maybe having an arrangement with a financial professional or having somebody in your family that you, you trust completely that you have their information also that they have access to maybe a safe deposit box or but but maybe a financial professional or an attorney and making sure that all of that information is there maybe the code for you subscribe to a password manager service and all your passwords are in there and and maybe a trusted financial professional or or your safe deposit box somebody has that information so it's not impossible to to access um, so yeah, that, all of that is, is huge. Yeah. It's, it's, it, listen, you, you struck the nail on the head. I mean, even as a, an everyday person, it's something that you have to have in order, but to get back to the caregiving again, this is Jennifer Fitzpatrick, healthcare experience expert. I, I, I got tongue tied on that in the beginning, okay. but I, I love that phrase and that, that is all Jennifer. I, I love it. I love it. So and again, cruising through caregiving, you can pick up the book at Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You're going to see the links. Scroll down the screen. We're going to get the Generations Health, where she has made her mark with webinars and consultations and such. But when you transition into the role of a new caregiver, what are some of your clients that come to you with the, the major obstacles? You know, maybe it's even for themselves. How how do they deal with it? How do they cope with not having their loved one around anymore or becoming that full-time caregiver in the home where their life has completely changed? So what are some of the biggest obstacles that you have heard through that transition? Well, for one, there's a lot of times difficulty within the family. Who's going to do what? And most of the time, caregiving does not shake out evenly. It doesn't that we usually we have one primary caregiver, the captain of the ship, but we want other family and friends and neighbors to rally around that primary caregiver, that captain of the ship and say, what can we do? Now, the person that's the primary caregiver has to be open because it's never a good idea for one individual to be a sole caregiver. If caregiving is the only thing that you have in your life, it's not going to go well for you. And it's not going to go well for your loved one. Years and years ago, my grandmother broke both of her shoulders and she had to be immobilized, her arms, her hands, her wrists for, for four weeks. And this is, she was in her sixties at the time. And my aunts and I, so three of my three aunts and I, we said, we will be with you all day, every day for four weeks. 
And we can make that promise because we knew there was going to be an end date. It wasn't indefinite. So we did it. And then at four weeks, she was back on track. She could drive. She could feed herself. She could go in the bath. I mean, it was, we really were her arms and her hands. We did everything. But when someone has maybe Alzheimer's disease, when somebody has, maybe they're, they're going through uh, any other number of chronic conditions that, that they will live for many years with, to make that commitment that you and just a couple of other people are going to do everything, that is very hard to keep that commitment. And so I really encourage families to not make promises, to, to, to say, I'm going to do the best that I can to take good care of you, but never say, well, we'll never move you. We'll never bring help into the home, or I'll be the only one that cares for you. Those promises often need to be broken because the family caregiver, the spouse, the adult child, whoever, they're exhausted. And caregiving should never be your entire life. It should be part of your life. And it can be an important part of your life, but it shouldn't do be the whole your whole life. That's a great quote. I love it. Uh, I, I do. Michael says, I really struggle with the mental aspect of caregiving, having to dedicate so much of my life for someone who doesn't think that I do anything extra for them. That's a very interesting comment. So, Michael, I'm going to ask you, uh, why do you think that your loved one doesn't think you do anything extra for them? Yeah, that, that that's, I mean, you know, maybe, you know, you're implying maybe, you know, you, you feel like because when you're in a relationship, whether it be husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, mother, father, right. You, you always kind of, you know, you, you, you look at direction through that other person and you may think really they're thinking or th saying one thing and they're really not. Right. So yeah, unfortunately that may be the case. So Michael, just let us know. Yeah. Let us you. know because I want to probe that a little bit. I think that, okay. So because you don't do that much for us. Okay. So I want to ask you, it, <laughs> and, and I'm curious, and, and feel free to write in, Michael, if you feel comfortable, but I'm wondering if this loved one always has been like that, if they've always been ungrateful. And if they have, how have you dealt with it in the past? And if they maybe are some, maybe they th this is new. Maybe they have dementia. Maybe their brain isn't working properly. There's depending on what the situation is, but if if this is somebody that's always sort of had an ungrateful attitude toward toward you and others in the family, I think what's really important for you to consider is talking to other caregivers or talking to a psychotherapist. Now, why do I say that? Because there are gonna there are tons of other people who have are going through that that their loved one doesn't realize how much of your life you're putting on hold for them. And now that said, if your loved one say has a, a degenerative cognitive issue like Alzheimer's or Lewy body or something like that, and they just, maybe they really, really genuinely don't understand what you're doing, then just accept that that's part of the disease process. But if this individual has always been ungrateful I think it's it's really important that you have to just make your peace with it that he or she is that's their perspective and you you really I think what's really important is that you get support elsewhere and also think about like whether it be from a support group whether it be from and and I can give you all kinds of information about support groups if people are interested how to find them but the, uh, or go into a psychotherapist or simply talking to people who care about you because most likely, okay, it's a mix of both. His stroke affected him. Um, he's stubborn and it takes <laughs> pride. He, it, it's hitting his pride. I think, Michael, the other big thing that I want you to remember when when this loved one, and it, maybe it's your dad, I'm not sure, if your dad feels like, or he's expressing that you're not doing enough or you're not helping out enough is I want you to remind yourself that just whatever you are doing is more than many older adults get from their loved ones. Because I can tell you of all my years working in this field, countless, 
countless older adults are in the United States that no family member is helping out. Nobody. Nursing homes and assisted living communities are filled with people who have no visitors. So whatever you are doing for, is it, if it's your dad or whoever it might be, it's more than many, many people have. And I think you have to set your boundaries and, and just do the best that you can in terms of set your boundaries and say, this is what I can give. And I'm, I, I'm not going to give up all my free time. Here, you know, if you have a job, if you have kids, if you have a family, you can't give everything to that individual that needs care. You have to set boundaries and you will, if you haven't already, you will make yourself physically and psychologically sick if you don't have some boundaries. So try to make peace with the fact that this person is just not going to appreciate you the way that you deserve to be appreciated and consider how you can get, how can, how can you make peace with that in terms of getting support elsewhere, whether it's a support group, whether it's friends, whether it's talking to a therapist. Yeah. And, and Michael says, I would love some support group information, maybe for other stuff. And Mike will get that for you. I promise. Um, Jennifer has it. I'll make sure you get it, buddy. 100%. Uh, Jeffrey checking in. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about on the Rolodex. He says, I keep my insurance, finance, credit card numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. When I update it, I give a copy to my kids. And also I've taken them to a financial advisor when I've met with him. When I go on vacation, I, I put the PW list in the folder with the financial info. That's great. Well, you're great. way ahead of everybody else, Jeff. Yeah. Way ahead of me, Jeff. <laughs> way ahead of everybody else because so many people have not done any of that. Um, I have done – my husband and I did our advanced directives and our wills back in our early 30s, and people were shocked. Like, oh, why would you – but we, we all need to do it. it it's yeah. not just for the elderly. It's for everybody. No, you're right, and, and we're going to get to that bomb in a second. Uh, but one well, reason why, but I have to ask you a question again. Cruising through caregiving is the book, you have to pick it up. I put it in the comments, it, it's Amazon Barnes. No, you get it on cruising through caregiving.com. Uh, Jennifer's one of one of Jennifer's websites, and we'll get to them. But Jennifer, I didn't ask you a question because one of the chapters I was very curious on this through uh, cruising through caregiving is don't be a martyr because martyrs die. So I'm curious, just to kind of give everybody a little bit of a tease, what that actually means and, and what, you know, why was that written? Well, I was raised Catholic and, you know, as many people in Philadelphia area were, yep. and I remember, you know, we'd, we'd see and hear about people martyring themselves and they, they died. Right. And I, I think. I always think of that when it comes to caregivers who make their entire life caregiving. You will suffer consequences physically, psychologically, spiritually, socially, financially, if caregiving is the only thing you have in your life. And listen, for a long time, we health and mental health professionals, we were scaring the heck out of caregivers. Uh, you're going to die early if you're caregiving. You got to take care of yourself. Well, the truth is not, the dad is really suggesting, no, that's not true. Being a caregiver doesn't push you to die prematurely. But what does is if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't have an outlet, if you are only doing caregiving and you're not sleeping and you're not eating properly and you're not exercising, it, it when we... And let's think about workaholics for a minute. If you happen to be a workaholic or if you know anybody that's a workaholic and then they retire and they have nothing on their schedule, what happens to them, Tony? Uh, you, they get lost. They don't know what to do. And a lot of them. <laughs> die well, from yeah. Yeah. I mean, die from they don't have brutal. anything. They don't have any get up and go anymore. They don't, they feel like you said, they feel lost. And so if you're a family caregiver, a lot of times the person you're taking care of is going to eventually pass away. And if that's your whole life and you've excluded friends and, and you, you haven't gone to the gym and you haven't, you know, kept up with spiritual and social practices, you what are you going to have left? And then God willing, maybe your loved one lives many, 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 many years. Well, 
if you're only caring for them and not for yourself, what do you have to give to them? What do you, what do you really have? If you are burnout, burnout caregivers, I hate to tell you, they don't do a good job. If you're not sleeping or eating properly, I mean, listen, I'm not saying you have to eat perfectly or you have to sleep, you know, perfectly, but if you're not making a reasonable effort with, with the basic health and mental health practices, best practices, you are just, you're not going to have anything to give them. And I got to tell you, even for the family members that are insistent that you have to be the one to take them to the doctor and you've got to be the one to make their meals and you've got to be the one that, that picks up their prescription. Here's the thing is that they need a break from you. Just like you need a break from them. They're, it's good for them to see other faces too. It's good for them. I, I use the example of my best friend's baby shower years ago when she became pregnant, I was throwing her a baby shower and I set everything up. I set up the, the restaurant and I got everything all together. And all of a sudden, like friends, her sisters-in-law and some of our mutual friends started reaching out. What can I do? And my first instinct was to say, no, don't do anything. I've got it. But they were making specific offers. Like, can I bring favors or do you have a cake yet? And I thought, oh yeah, that actually would make things easier. So I accepted their help, right? And here's the thing. Not only did it make my job easier being a host of this party, but my girlfriend, Megan, when she saw the way all of her friends and family came together to celebrate for her, the day meant more to her because she was so touched that different people participated. And it's the same idea with family caregiving. I think people want to help. Now, listen, I know that everybody on here, they've got some relative that does nothing. I know that. We all have that happen in our families. But for every relative that does nothing, I bet you there's a neighbor, there's a friend of mom's, there's somebody from your faith community. There's There are people that are willing to do something. And you just have to make it known. And in Cruising Through Caregiving, if you go to the website, cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, you can download all the worksheets for free. And one of the worksheets is called the MET exercise, M-E-T. And it stands for money, energy, time, getting your needs met, M-E-T. And it's a, it's a little exercise on how to find help within your friend family network and how to delegate. And it gives you step by step, like how to parse out activities that you specifically don't need to be the one to do. That maybe somebody else, maybe a grandkid that lives in a different state can do research, for example, uh, about services that you might need. Or another person that lives across town can pick up the prescriptions or pick up the groceries or it, it's it's all a matter of what are you willing to accept and i know that a lot of times in the beginning family caregivers they know nope, they have that instinct of nope nope i can do it i don't but as time goes by you just it's it's not going to work unless you accept some help yeah it's a great point and what jennifer's alluding to right there you see on the screen uh, you just go to cruising through caregiving.com you put your your email address in there and right there is free chapter of cruising through caregiving and worksheets from the book to really really help you out now i have to say now mike says it's a great point we get tired of each other sometimes and and me and jennifer did a, a media tour of caregiver burnout about a couple years ago right and it was such a great topic because it's so true you're never going to be the person you should be if you're burnt out. I, you have to give yourself a mental break. And I'm not a caregiver, but I just know in my daily life with three kids and a family that, guess what? You get mentally exhausted. And when you're mentally exhausted, you can't open your eyes. You, you're, you're falling asleep at the computer. You're doing nobody any good, let alone your own self-health. So I think that's a great point that people need to adhere to. So we have the bomb in the room, I'm going to call it, because... <laughs> Right. I, I, I have to say, because it's, you know, we're going to talk about COVID-19. We're going to talk about the pandemic. And the reason why I want to talk about it is because I know you've been on you know, the front line, so to speak, when it comes to senior care and you just start doing live events. We talked about that. Um, so you're actually back out and you're, everybody can see your face finally, um, which is great because I think there's a good mixture of both. But just a general question. COVID-19 has affected so many different industries, 
But how have you seen it affect senior care facilities, senior care, care? Because there was a lot, especially in the beginning, about that. They were like ground zero. Nobody wants to step foot into a nursing home, right? And there was a lot of people that got left behind in the very beginning. So overall, what have you seen through this whole pandemic that unfortunately is still going on? Tony, it's such a loaded question because I, I know, so many, I know so many lessons learned. I will say that, listen, so I, I'm just one caveat, well, or sorry, one disclosure. I was not on the front lines. I worked from home yeah. during the pandemic, but I worked with uh, communities and family caregivers the entire time, like did lots of conversations, lots of events, lots of coaching, lots of consulting. One of my primary concerns about what's come out of all of this is that we have, I think we got really tunnel vision that COVID-19 was the only thing that we looked at in terms of, it's, it, I guess what I'm getting at is I, the way that we've isolated older adults has really concerned me. And there right now, I, I see a lot of older adults that are vaccinated. It's wonderful. And they're still terrified to do anything. And now that said, there's a lot of older adults that are the exact opposite, that they've not, they've been like, all right, I'm 85. I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. You know, something's going to kill me. But I think, and I think a lot of family caregivers and adult kids, a lot of middle-aged adult kids have been really overly protective in terms of, no, you want to be cautious. You don't want to bring your 85 year old mother into the COVID ward of a hospital. But I, I've worked with a lot of families like, I don't want my mother going to Thanksgiving. Well, why not? I mean, she's vaccinated and she wants to go to Thanksgiving. She wants to be around the great grandkids. I think we have to treat older adults like adults. And I think we have to, as a society, yet, it, yes, COVID-19 is still a concern. Definitely people pass away from it. People get very, very sick from it. But I also think that we, we need, we need to be around other life is not meant to be lived completely on zoom and we need other people. Part of good physical, physical and mental health, not just mental health, but physical health is socializing. And I, I think we, I think we we just need to realize that a lot of older adults, I think, have and and younger people have really developed so much fear during this time. And yes, there COVID is is something that's cr critical and important, and we need to keep our eye on it for sure. But I just I want people to remember it's. I, I have a friend that that you know she and her husband got COVID and. They were just so mad at themselves. And I said, well, you know, it's a respiratory virus. People sometimes get it. You know, it, before, before uh, 18, 19 months ago, if someone got the flu or if someone got a respiratory infection, they didn't blame themselves. They weren't sitting around like, oh, my gosh, like I'm such a bad person. I shouldn't have gone here. I shouldn't have gone there. So I think it's really they, I think it's important that uh, older adults and their families, they, they look at the risk benefit of, you know, letting the, the older person play with their grandkids or, or going out and, and seeing friends. I think that, that, uh, we need, and also treating older adults like adults, they're grownups. They, if they don't have advanced dementia, they should be making their own decisions. So those are just a couple thoughts I had. I worry about the mental health of a lot of us, um, and and what the lack of of engaging with others can maybe do. Oh, you you hit the nail on it. I'll be honest with you because and and just as as often as to, or I should say just as early as today, um, I've spoken to somebody who said the same thing. So I, I'm a youth sports coach, and for the longest time, it was mom, dad, that's it. No grandparents on the sideline. Nobody's allowed to attend games, right? So now that it's opened back up, I still do get the the question, not the actually question statement that they don't want to come back because they're they're afraid. And it it is it's a shame. It really is because you said mentally that that is exhausting. Uh it, just because it, it you know emotionally you become distraught, you're not seeing your grandkids, you're not seeing what you used to do and and when this first came out, they said that life would be changed forever. 
And unfortunately, they were 100% correct. I mean, not everything, but there are certain things that the, the mindset of people, whether it be kids, adults, doesn't matter. The mindset has absolutely, in my opinion, changed forever. And and I know through caregiving, through yourself, through all the, the teachings and the webinars you do, you see this firsthand. You have people that come to you that are distraught. Like, a, a, as a caregiver, do you think that people now, unfortunately, will decide even – Here's a good question. Maybe they want to put their their loved one in senior care, but now that they're afraid to do it, that's actually giving them a disservice, correct? Well, okay, Tony, that's a great, a great question. There's a couple of things. One, in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of family caregivers regress. Like I worked with one family where the woman had a job and she had her mom in adult day. And her mom had Alzheimer's and the day adult day shut down. And now woman's working at home. Mom is at home and mom's literally climbing the walls all day, trying to wander out of the house. So the, this caregiver did this really responsible thing. She got her mom into this wonderful therapeutic program. They have meals, they have activities, exercise, and now it's shut down. And now this poor woman is just sitting around the house all day watching TV and the daughter's trying to work. And so it's like, I know a lot of people are like, do I send my mom back to adult day? Is it safe? Is she going to be okay? And they, and it's like, I think a, a lot of us have lost the ability to do a cost benefit analysis. Like maybe, okay. She, not to say again, COVID can be very dangerous, but okay. She's vaccinated. Let's maybe going back and having that routine, having exercise, having healthy meals at the, at the center might be really good. But I think also it's the same idea with bringing an aide into the home or moving to senior living. Now, one of the things I will say, Tony, about I think a lot of families have thought about senior living as almost a good or better option than they did before the pandemic because they saw like when all those shortages were happening, like toilet paper and all that weird stuff. Well, the senior living communities had all that stuff you know, they had plenty yeah. of it. <laughs> they didn't have trouble. They didn't um, have any issues. <laughs> right? so they, they, you know, we, we were all at the grocery store looking for chicken and <laughs> had chicken, right? So, uh, so there, I, and, and that, that there was healthcare all the time on site. And so I think, I think we're still going to be watching all of the, we're going to still be watching the ramifications for all this shaking out for the next couple of years. I, the one thing that I think is is really th that I want to just urge all families and all individuals to be thinking about constantly is the risk benefit analysis. It, avoiding one, and now listen, if you've got six comorbidities, you know, you've got to take different precautions perhaps than somebody that's younger and healthier. But I think life is all about risk benefit analysis. Like what, you know, at, leaving your house to take a walk, there's a risk. Staying in bed all day is a risk. I mean, think about it. Like you can have being, in, you know, not, not exercising, not moving around. There's risks. Every decision we make, but I think to a certain extent, it's like we've, as a society in some ways, made it that all we're thinking about is how to avoid COVID. And we're not realizing that some of these, uh, some of these adaptations that we've made commonplace are really not perhaps so good for our mental health. It's a great point, as always, a great point. And again, we're speaking to Jennifer Fitzpatrick, a healthcare experience expert, again, author of Cruising Through Caregiving. And we're going to do, if there's anybody watching, I understand some people don't like their, their name out there. So if you want to ask a question after the show, you can do that as well. All you do is need to type it in the comments. But right now, if you want to ask a question, you can ask away. We'll put it up there. I'll read it. If you don't want your name up there, Jennifer can answer it. Whatever you feel comfortable with that's what we can do tony can i give a couple resources yes please okay. please so do. there's a couple one for one i wanted to plug uh hfc which is the charity that was started by actor seth rogan and his wife lauren miller rogan and i'm on the care advisory board for them it's we are hfc.org we are hfc.org and they provide respite grants free 
for people who are caring for their loved one at home. So you can apply for a free respite grant and it's only for dementia caregivers though. So that's a great resource. They also have lots of virtual support groups. Another resource I wanna encourage everybody to go to if you're taking care of an older loved one is the uh, uh, N as in Nancy, for number four a.org and for a.org and that you can find your local area agency on aging and that's an organization every city every county in the country has one and so if you go there that is sort of a a launching point for if you are trying to find resources that can help you whether they be free, whether they be low cost, or whether you want a list of, you know, maybe even more expensive services that are out there. But there, the Meals on Wheels, you can access that information through there. Actually, it uh, it's actually uh, n4a.org. Yeah, it, it actually changes. Oh, to, does it go to USA? Yeah. Okay, got yep. it. Okay, cool, yep. cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that is, that. those are a couple of, of really, really good resources that can point in the right direction. And and then ALZ.org for the Alzheimer's Association. And by the way, if you go and find your local area agency on aging, they can give you a list of support groups as well. Uh, the other one that if you are a dementia caregiver, ALZ.org, dementia support groups and dementia education, both virtual and in person. Tons of tons of great information. Again, it's in the comments. Everybody, you know, you can watch this on replay. You can click on it. You can go to it. Um, last thing I want to finish out with here, Jennifer, is again, we're we're just starting this up a little bit, but I think it's a really good uh because we've talked about this and it kind of brings everything full circle. And it is great. It, it's actually our pitch topic for the next couple of weeks, which is employee versus caregiver. Is there a healthy balance? And one of the quotes is there's a total of 53 million unpaid family caregivers in the U.S. That's an extraordinary amount, according to AARP data. 56% of caregivers are employed full time, and that's research from caregiver.org. And on average, employee caregivers work 34.7 hours a week. So, Jennifer, how, if you are a mom, if you are a dad, if you have a family, and we're, how do you maintain a healthy balance. I know we've kind of touched on it a lot of a little tidbits here and there, but how do you differentiate between employee and caregiver? Well, now it's harder than ever before because so many people are working from home. It's like there's no there's no separation at all. I think for a lot of individuals, they're enjoying working from home, and a lot of companies are recreating their policies. But some people they want to go to work because they want to have a separation. Uh, I think the best thing to do is really just be open to help from other people. Be really careful about quitting your job if you need the money. I see that happen a lot. That families get so overwhelmed. It's like, okay, well, is, am I even making any money? Uh, it, it, it does it even make any sense for me to continue working if, if I'm running around and I've got my mom and I've got my kids, but think about the benefits. Think about what you're putting into your 401k or your 403b. Think about that. It, it, it just consider that and, and definitely, you know, work with your employer if you need to uh, about maybe being a little bit more flexible. But also, if you're getting to the point where you can't get your work done, I'm sorry. If you feel like you you're you're just you're not able to get all of it done, you need more help. And it might be time to say like adult day, senior living, nursing home, bringing an aid into the home, or just allowing more friends and family to help. You're not supposed to do it all. Again, like the example I gave about my grandmother, I mean, my aunts and I all had jobs when we took care of her for those four weeks, but guess what? It, it, that was four weeks. Years later, my grandmother uh, had congestive heart failure and she had a lot of health issues. And there were probably 10 of us on a rotating basis, taking turns, sleeping in our apartment night after night. And we finally had to say, like, we all had jobs, people had kids, people have stuff going on in their life. And we had to say, okay, it's time. We And we had like 11 people. That's a lot more than a lot of families have in the mix to help. So 
you got to be realistic about your boundaries. You need to decide how much you can really do. And ultimately with that situation with my grandmother, we said, look, you know, we can't have someone sleeping here every single night. People aren't getting a good night's sleep. People have to go to work the next day. So here's some choices. You know, will you consider letting us bring some paid help into the home? Would you consider senior living? And a lot of us don't like having conversations like that with the older loved one, but they are necessary if the per and and this what it my grandmother did not have dementia. If your loved one has dementia, you're probably not going to be able to have a conversation like that because they're not going to remember a little while later. But you're going to have to take steps in order to so you you're able to 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 keep yourself going. Yeah, that's a really good point. And John checking in says, what do you think is the responsibility of nursing schools to prepare students to support, educate home and community bases, caregiving organization and family caregivers? Ooh, that's a loaded question. It's a really good <laughs> question, John. Um, here's the thing. We already had a nursing shortage before the pandemic. Good point. I know that the nursing schools are doing the best that they can. Uh, and it's tough because I think people working in senior care is not the first choice for a lot of nurses. Now, for some it is, but a lot of people, as you can expect, want to work with children. They want to work in primary care. Um, I, as somebody who's taught at the college level for many, you know, for over 20 years, I've taught plenty of nursing students and I'm always delighted when they want to take gerontology. But to be honest with you, John, I, I I don't even know that I am really able to answer that question because I feel like the nursing schools are just trying to get prepared, qualified people out there because we have a shortage in every area of healthcare. And I don't, I'm not going near the whole conversation about vaccine mandates. I'm not getting into that. It's to me, it's too politicized, but we are losing people because of those mandates as well. So before the pandemic, we had a lot of people, um, you know, we had a shortage for every practice setting for nursing. During the pandemic, people were quitting and people were saying, I don't need this, or I'm going to find a different job in nursing where maybe I could work from home or I could teach or, you know, I'm going to get out of the trenches. But now, again, with, when we throw in all the, the controversy over the vaccines, I think we're losing, you know, even even more nurses. So I, I am hopeful. I'm so hopeful that we're able to, you know, keep recruiting. I personally worry about it for myself as I age, as we all age, because I think we just simply because of the growing aging population, we don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough social workers. We don't have enough docs that specialize in geriatrics and gerontology. So I don't know. I probably didn't answer the question the way that you were hoping for, but it's a little out of my area of expertise because I'm not a nursing professor, but that would be a great question for a nursing school. So, well, you touched on a couple things. They're so true. I mean, we, we, we have seen a lot of people now just mentally distraught saying, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I'm not, you know, so it, it is a good point. But what I want to touch on before we get out of here is we've talked about cruising through caregiving, but Generations Health, which is you know, obviously the, the central point of everything that you do. So I want you to elaborate on that as well, because you have so many fantastic webinars and so many different opportunities based upon that brand. So Generations Health, explain it. What is oh, sure. it? And, okay. Yeah. So our mission at Generations Health Education is to help healthcare and mental health and senior living organizations transform patients and clients from hateful to grateful. And basically that's going to be, that's the title of my second book that I'm working on right now, Hateful to Grateful. And what we do is we work with health, senior living, mental health organizations to help them endear themselves to clients and patients. Nobody wants to go to the hospital. Nobody wants to place their mom in an assisted living. No one's like excited to hire a home care aide, right? And But these are necessities, getting surgery, getting marriage counseling, all of those things. So we work with organizations to create partnerships and relationships with their clients and patients. And then also with 
obviously I have the book cruising through caregiving, but we do tons of education for health and mental health professionals. We do coaching, executive coaching for health and mental health professionals. And we do a lot of family caregiving education, um, lots of free events that we have sponsored. So uh, also we do coaching with individual caregivers who are looking to be pointed in the right direction. So uh, I have a team, I have a great team in place that that works with, with healthcare and mental health and senior living organizations, as well as family caregivers. And I'm really excited about my next book. I'm hope, ho hopefully, I, I should be announcing the publication date soon, but um, probably early 2023 is what I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, probably, probably late 2022 or early 2023. We got a teaser there for a new book. I like it. I like it. Got to, got to keep them guessing, Jennifer. Got to keep them guessing. But um, final thoughts. Uh, let, let's do this. So before we get out of here, and again, if anybody has any questions, you don't have to be live to ask. Put them in the comments. You go to the Rise React Media YouTube page. This will be all over. Just put the comments in, and we will get them to Jennifer and get you some answers. But Jennifer, final thoughts, caregiving as a whole, what do you have? There's not one way to be a good caregiver. There are many, many, many ways that you can be a good caregiver. So don't, don't beat yourself up. Do the best that you can while having a life. That's that, I love it. Absolutely. I love it. And, and, and what would you say the best way for people to get in contact with you, you obviously we cruising through caregiving.com generations, health.com. What's the best way people can contact you for any kind of information whatsoever? Just go into either one of those contact at generationshealth.com and we'll get back to you with any uh, questions. If you'd like to partner with us or work with us, we'd love to hear from you. Well, Jennifer, this has been fantastic. As always, for everybody checking in, again, cruising through caregiving.com. The links for the book are in the comments. Actually, go pick up a copy today. Don't forget. When you pick the copy up, leave a review and let us know what you think so Jennifer knows that she's reaching the audience that she wants. So for everybody, for, for your host, Tony Cotillo, for Jennifer Fitzpatrick, uh, I want to thank you. Everybody have a fantastic evening. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next time.